with us, man, we're so glad that you are here with us. If you're watching online, man, thanks for joining us. We're planning on having a great night tonight, and uh, we're starting a new series. I get the honor of kicking off uh, this series, Signs. And so I'm excited about this series because I believe that God wants to do something in us in this series that is going to completely change the trajectory of where we're headed, of why we're here. It's going to remind us that we have purpose no matter what season we're in. How many of you know that you have purpose no matter what season you're in? And uh, the Bible talks about how these signs are going to follow those who believe that they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover that you're going to have some serious signs that follow you when you believe, that the power of God accompanies you when you actually believe. How many of you are thankful that God didn't leave us in this world powerless, but he gave us power to go ahead and do what he called us to do? I don't know about you, but I'm just so thankful for that. So I want to talk to you uh, for the next few moments from from this idea in our series, Signs, uh, this idea of stop. So I have here a, a stop sign, and we're going to talk from this idea of, of stop. And if you're looking for an alternate title, uh, just write the Kingdom Commission. Just write Kingdom Commission. And turn with me to Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. We're reading it out of the New International Version, the NIV. Come on, somebody. It says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel To all creation, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Jesus here, he's talking to a group of his disciples, and he's telling them, hey, I'm giving you this commission. I'm sending you out on a mission, and I want you to make this mission the very purpose for your life. Jesus is telling his disciples, this is something that I want you to grab onto and I want you to run with. I want you to run with the good news of the gospel and I want you to spread it everywhere. I want you to tell anyone who will listen, go into all the world. And I believe just like these disciples that Jesus is actually talking to, that as followers of Jesus today, the commission hasn't changed. Our main mission in this world has not changed. And I just want to encourage somebody tonight that the Great Commission should be your greatest mission in this life. I love this because it's not the great suggestion, but it's the Great Commission. It's the Great Commission. Jesus commanded us to go out. And what I love about that is when Jesus sends you, how many of you know it's better to be sent than just to go? Because when you're sent, you have an equipment and an empowerment that he gives you to go do everything that he called you to do. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that we serve a God who doesn't just say, hey, go, and I'm going to leave you powerless. You're not going to have the empowerment. He says, go, and all of the power of heaven will back you up as you go so that people that you're preaching this gospel to will see my power demonstrated and they will know that I'm God. See, I love this verse. It resonates with me because part of our vision here at Faith Family is that we go to reach people who are far from God. We go to reach people who are far from God. This is who we are and this is why we're here. And and I'm hoping tonight, my prayer for you tonight is that something stirs in your spirit, that no matter what season you find yourself in, that you find purpose in it, and that you understand that you're here on purpose for a purpose, that you have a mission to accomplish while you're here on the earth. So I want to share with you just really quickly uh, three things of how we reach people far from God, how we reach people far from God. If you're taking notes, write that down. How to reach people who are far from God. The first one is, I believe that we've got to stop and we've got to remember. We've got to remember. We've got to remember where we were. Stop and remember. There's something about remembering, is there not? There's something about remembering where you once were. And I love this in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, think about this. When you and I were at our worst, 
That's when God gave his best. When you and I were in our darkest place, that's when the light of the truth of Jesus came on the scene of our lives. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's good for me to just remember that I once was lost, but now I'm found. Sometimes you need to remember that you once were bound, but now you're free. That you once were in the kingdom of darkness, but now you've been translated into the kingdom of light. That once you had no hope, but now you have a hope, and that hope Hope is an anchor to your soul, steadfast and secure, so that when the winds blow and the storms come, you don't have to be moved, but you can be fixed immovably by the anchor that is Jesus. I don't know if there's anybody tonight that can testify to the difference that Jesus has made. Come on, he's made all the difference. And when you remember, when you remember where you were, all of a sudden, man, you just get this thankfulness and this gratitude about yourself. Some of you, you might have been discouraged in this season because maybe when you remember where you were, it's like, yeah, kind of, but like, I, I'm just not happy with, with where I'm at. Maybe when you remember where you were, you've been stuck in the past sin and the past shame. You think about all the things that you did wrong. And I think that we need to reframe when we remember what Jesus did, remembering that it was a once and for all payment for our sins, that Jesus went to a cross, he bled and died to take guilt and shame from us so that we don't have to live as victims of our past, but we can live excited and anticipating our future. I believe somebody needs to hear that, that Jesus, when he paid that price, he paid for your sins, past, present, and future. The Bible says this, that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You've been cleansed. You've been made righteous. You are accepted. You are loved. You are free. You are healed. Come on, sometimes you have to remind yourself that even if you're not where you want to be tonight that thank God you're not where you should be because his grace came on the scene. I don't know about you, but I'm just so grateful for what Jesus has done in my life. And as I think about and I remember, take a moment and I stop and I remember what he's done. I remember where I was and where I am now. Some of you, you never imagined yourself. You're sitting here tonight. Can we just celebrate the fact that you're sitting here tonight? You're watching online tonight. Man, maybe a year ago. Think about a year ago. Think about two years ago. Think about all the things that God's brought you through and where he's brought you to. When I remember where I was, it helps me do the second thing. It helps me recognize where they are. Sometimes you've got to stop and recognize where people without Jesus really are, the condition that they're really in. There's this passage of scripture that I love that has been transformational for me. It's found in Matthew 9. If you're taking notes, I want you to jot that down. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, uh, it, it's this, this thing where Jesus is traveling. It says that he's traveling through all the towns and villages, preaching in the synagogues, announcing this good news about the kingdom, it says when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, it's ready, it's ripe, but the laborers are so few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest and ask him to send more laborers into his fields. And I love those four verses. I believe those four verses of scripture have the ability and the, the, the capacity to move us forward on this mission. Why? Because there's a couple things I want to highlight. In verse 36, it says that Jesus, when he saw the crowds, this is amazing to me. You're like, really? This is amazing to me. If you, if you look at Jesus all throughout the New Testament, Jesus was pressed with crowds wherever he went. Jesus had to intentionally get away to get on his own to pray and to spend time with God because he was pressed with crowds everywhere that he went. And so when Jesus saw the crowds, Jesus always saw crowds. But it's not just talking about seeing at face value. It's talking about he recognized the condition that they were in. He recognized where they were really at. How do I know that? Because in the next passage, it says, the next verse, 
that he was moved with compassion. As I think about this, I wonder how many times I've gone through my routine, my day-to-day. And I've been around people, but I haven't actually seen people. Case in point, your daily routine, sometimes when you're at Starbucks in the morning and when you're in line, we're talking pre-COVID, when you're in the building and in line, sometimes you're, you're seeing people as just like objects in your way to get what you want. Come on, don't judge me. Some of you love your coffee and you're like, I'm just trying to get that so that I can feel awake again. And you don't really actually see people. We get so stuck in a routine and trying to go from station to station, get from place to place, get through what we need to get through, that we fail to actually stop and recognize the the divine appointments that are all around us. We fail to recognize the condition that people are in. And I believe that compassion, what Jesus was moved with, it's the emotion of our gospel. See, compassion will take you beyond just, oh man, I feel sorry for them. I feel bad for him. Compassion will take you beyond just that feeling and drive you to action. It'll cause you to do something. It'll cause you to act. And I I know and I can identify the times in my life where I've been so busy in my routine that I've failed to recognize the people around me. I also know the seasons where I wake up and I'm like, God, use me today. Use me in the life of of somebody. Can I tell you what a dangerous prayer is? A dangerous prayer is, God, use me in the life of somebody today. Use me to minister life. God, help me to recognize the God opportunities. Help me to recognize the divine appointments all around me. Don't pray that unless you mean it. Because here's the deal. When you pray that prayer, it's dangerous and God will do that. I'm so amazed when I pray that and I'm aware of my purpose while I'm here and I'm recognizing the needs of others. I'm amazed by the conversations that get started. I'm amazed by sometimes the interactions that I have. I have had complete strangers, I kid you not, start full conversations with me in lines. And if I weren't of the right mindset, I would totally miss it that that was, that was something that was a God opportunity for me to walk in love towards somebody, encourage somebody, those types of things. Here's what I found, that I found some people will say, some Jesus followers, some Christians will say things like this to me sometimes. Well, my Christian life, man, it's just mundane. Like it's just, I feel like I'm at this stale place. I feel like I'm just kind of kind of stagnant with it. Like my relationship with God is kind of stale, kind of mundane, kind of boring. I just think to myself, then you're not doing it right. Because I can't remember the last time in my life that I wasn't stretched beyond my comfort. Some of you just have to have a willingness to be sensitive to the Spirit of God and a willingness to be stretched beyond your comfort zone. Can I encourage somebody tonight that your greatest opportunity for ministry, your greatest opportunity to live out this mission is outside of your comfort zone and it's not with having convenience as a high priority, it's with having being used as a high priority every day when you and I wake up. It is an opportunity when our feet hit the floor, we have breath in our lungs, it is an opportunity opportunity for us to go ahead and say, God, here I am. Use me. Holy Spirit, flow through me. Lead me. Guide me. Direct me into the path of somebody that needs the hope that is in Jesus. That is a dangerous prayer to pray. But can I tell you that if you pray it, you will continually be stretched and you will find yourself highly effective. And all of a sudden, you start to live a life of purpose. Can I tell you, there is no place, there is no place of more joy than living a life of purpose. Life becomes somewhat depressing when it's all about you. Life lacks joy when it's all about you. But when you make your life about him and you start to look upward and you're cultivating this relationship with God, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you start to realize, man, I have a purpose while I'm here. If I can be really honest with you, I remember a time in my life, it was right around the time that I felt called uh, to ministry. I was like 18, 19 years old, and what I realized about myself, if I'm being just completely honest, what I realized about myself 
is that I was more interested in learning the Bible and enhancing my life as a believer than I actually was reaching the lost. It's not that I didn't care. It's not that I didn't think reaching the lost was was cool and everything. But if I'm just honest, I noticed there was a gap that I was way more excited about learning about faith and you know, what God had done for me, which I'm not putting those two things at odds, don't get me wrong. I still love that. I still value that. So I'm not putting those things at odds, but I noticed there was an imbalance. Like, I was so consumed with that that I wasn't really interested in the lost or reaching people at all. And I'll never forget, I prayed this prayer. God, give me a heart for what you have a heart for. I just wanna have a heart for what you have a heart for. Because I remember sitting in church and being like, hearing somebody talk about reaching the lost, about the Great Commission. I remember thinking, like, that's not as high on my priority list as it should be. That's not right now my greatest mission. But I want it to be. I prayed that prayer. And you know what? God did. God started to give me a heart for what he had a heart for. All of a sudden, I started to realize, man, there are divine opportunities all around me. I believe the third thing is this, that we need to recognize why we're here. There's a reason that you and I are on the earth. There's a reason that you and I are alive right now. There's a reason that God uh, has saw it fit for us to be here during this time. I've actually had Christians say this to me. Well, I'm just biding my time. I'm waiting for the rapture. I don't want to bide my time and wait for the rapture. I want to understand that I was called for such a time as this. And as the world gets darker, the light shines brighter. As the world gets darker, we have such a great opportunity as the body of Christ to go ahead and represent him well. Man, I believe that there's something so vital about that. There's something so important, so crucial that we recognize about that. That we're here. We're here for a purpose. That we're here to minister life to people. There are people in our spheres of influence that are far from God. And I want to ask you this question. Who's close to you but far from God? Who in your world is is close to you but far from God? I love this because in recognizing why why we're here, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says this. It says, but you are the chosen ones by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference that he's made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. I don't know about you, but I love this. I love this passage because it highlights what you and I are here for, that we're here to tell of the night and day difference that God has made, that he's taken us from being rejected to being accepted. And I'll never forget when I started to realize this and I prayed that prayer and I I started to do that, I started to see my workplace differently. I started to see it differently. I worked a packaging job. I boxed up stuff and I put it on a pallet and that's what I did. And everybody that I worked with, I was 18, 19, Uh, I'm a freshman in college. I worked with a bunch of seniors in college. And then my supervisor was like probably 25 years older than me. And, And sometimes for me, it was really hard to feel like I had influence over people that were older than me. It was really hard for me to feel like I was leading or I was being a witness to somebody that had so much more life experience and You know, in some cases, thought they were so much cooler than me. I was just like, man, this is difficult. But I love that the Bible says, let no one despise your youth. I love that. And I started to get a hold of some of these things. And I remember packaging, and I was really excited. I started to see it as an opportunity. And I started inviting people to church, like, hey, man, like, you got to come here with me. You got to come to church with me. It's going to be awesome. We've got this event that's going on. It's going to be the greatest. You know how you go to church, everything's the greatest. You're just like, it's going to be awesome. Ah, man, I got something going on. Man, I got so many no's, it was crazy. Can I encourage you? Don't be discouraged by no's. Don't be discouraged when people say no. Don't let that steal your passion for it. Man, it's our job on this earth to plant seeds and extend invitations. We can't get so easily offended when people say no. 
And I remember one day, like after so many no's for so long, I remember one day, my supervisor, she must have got them all together. And she said, you know what? Like, this kid has invited us. He's invited us a lot of times, all of us. Maybe we should humor him one day, and maybe this week we should just go with him. You know he's going to ask. Maybe we should all just go. And so, of course, I ended up asking, and they were like, yeah, we actually decided we're, we're all going to come with you. I was like, this is awesome. Let's go. It's going to be great. I remember, like, I invited him on a Wednesday. We had uh, the United that night, and it uh, wasn't called the United back then, but that's beside the point. I was just excited they were there. And I didn't want them sitting in the back, you know. I wanted them sitting in the second row. So front row, a little intimidating maybe, but I wanted them in the second row. Why? I wanted them to feel it when worship started. I wanted them to feel the Holy Spirit moving. Yeah. I wanted it, boom. I wanted to hit them. I wanted the Holy Spirit, I wanted them to feel the presence of God in the room. I want them to experience God in a real way. So second row, I'm like, this is great. They're like, really, second row? Okay, here we go. And I remember looking down. Like, you know how you do when you invite somebody? You're kind of like, I'm worshiping. What are you doing? You know, you're looking out of the corner of your eye. And I remember looking down at the end. We had a response time, a lot like we're going to do tonight in just a moment. And I saw tears. Multiple of them had tears streaming down their face. One of them raised their hand and rededicated. The other two didn't. They, didn't. they didn't make a decision at all. But seeds were planted. And questions and conversations came up after that. I think sometimes as followers of Jesus, we have to be okay with the fact that we're planting seeds. Sometimes as a young believer, it was my thought that I had to seal the deal with everybody right away, and we're just planting seeds. The Bible talks about it. One plants, another waters, but, but God gives the increase. It's not my job to do God's job. It's not my job to do the Holy Spirit's job in someone's life. It's just my job to plant seeds and water seeds and continue to invite and continue to reach out and continue to talk about the greatness of the God that I serve as I remember what he's done for me, as I remember where I was, and I recognize where people were. Some of you, think about this last year. Think about how much you came through and think about going through all of that without God. Think about going through all of that without God. This is the condition of people in our world who are far from God. And I believe that we need in this hour and in this day, the church to rise up and realize that we were called for such a time as this to tell of the difference that Jesus has made so that we can make a difference in our sphere of influence because I guarantee you that there are some people who are far from God, but they're close to you and you've been commissioned to get the word out about how great your God is. I'll never forget this because uh, it was a special moment. You know, it was back when the Cavs were good, you know, a long time ago. When they had LeBron and Kyrie, and they're in game seven of the finals. And I had some friends call me up, and they're like, hey, we're going to Cleveland. I was like, let's do this, man. I'm not talking about going into the arena. Game seven was in, like, it was in California. It was in Golden State. You know what I'm saying? So, you had the tickets to go into the arena to watch it on the screen, but we didn't get those in time. We were going to stand outside and watch it on a big screen in this big open area in between the queue and the Indian Stadium. Right in between there, there was this big place, and I was like, let's go, let's do this. I had a couple friends like, no, nah, I want to stay. I want to just watch on my big screen and eat food. I was like, forget that. I want to be where the action is. There's going to be thousands of people. We went thousands. I kid you not. Thousands of people. It was amazing. As far as my eyes could see, I looked everywhere. I'm like, this is amazing. This is crazy. It's awesome. They're, they had these barricades up. 
But those were nowhere to be seen. They had been knocked down because the crowd was like, nope, I'm getting in the center. I want to be where the action is. So we're watching the game. I'll, I'll never forget the energy that was in the air, the anticipation that was there. Just the overall enthusiasm of everybody. It was like there was something in the air. And I remember just taking it all in. And I'm like, this is, this is incredible. And I'll never forget, there were a couple moments. Kyrie hit a three-pointer. And then LeBron had this block. I don't know if you've heard about it. But it kind of sealed the deal. The roar that erupted from that crowd I kid you not, I've heard nothing like it. The roar that erupted. All of a sudden, there's this this roar. I remember when that clock went went zero. Everybody's screaming. Everybody's jumping. Have you ever seen a grown man cry? It It was crazy. Grown men weeping, screaming, cheering, dancing in the streets, Thousands of people. Some big burly man gave me a hug. I didn't even know him. Picked me up. So, whoa, big man, put me down, bro. Not cool. My friend Noah, he's on somebody's shoulders that he doesn't know, and they're, like, running around with him. He's not the biggest dude, so I'm like, they're going to break him. I better follow. And so I'm fighting through this crowd, and literally, there are tears. There are grown men crying, grown men screaming, grown men dancing, grown men shouting, grown men doing all of that. And all of a sudden, in that moment, I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke something to me. What if the church got this excited about what Jesus has done for them? See, here's the deal. This is my conviction. If I can get excited, and I get excited in a basketball game. When LeBron had that block, you better believe I was right there with him. Yeah, boy, let's go. If I can get that excited about LeBron James, where I didn't even, I didn't even win anything. Like, I didn't get anything. In fact, I probably lost like 65 bucks because I bought the T-shirt, I bought the hat, and I bought Chipotle before the game. I didn't win anything. But yet I was able to get loud. How much more should I be able to get loud? How much more should I be able to get excited? How much more should I be able to lift a joyful noise up to the one who has saved me, who has raised me, who has freed me, who has healed me, who has made me righteous, who set my feet on solid ground? I'm no longer who I once was. I've been bought with a price. When you start to get an excitement about yourself, about what Jesus has done for you, you can't keep quiet about it. I wonder how many people would come into the house if the church would rise up with excitement and enthusiasm. Like, I don't know what's going to happen tonight, but I know it's going to be something supernatural. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. But I know it's going to be something that I've never seen before. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. But man, I know God, the God of the universe, he's going to perform a miracle in somebody's life. See, we're not just here to take up space. We're here to stop. We're here to remember. We're here to recognize. And we're here to realize why we're here. These signs are going to follow those who believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I wonder what would happen if the atmosphere of faith would raise. I wonder what would happen if the level of expectation on a Wednesday night would go up. I wonder if just like those fans at a Cavs game who thought they were going to see something they had never seen before. I wonder if we came to church with that same sort of anticipation. What would happen? See, because I believe we've got to put a demand on the anointing of God in this hour. The people of this generation, they don't need to just hear God talked about and his power talked about. They need to see it demonstrated with signs, wonders, and miracles. And I wonder if over these next few moments, if we could just get really excited, if we could just get a spirit of faith about ourselves. See, faith gives you an imagination to see what it is that you're believing God for in the future. I see this place packed out, don't have room for anybody else. 
I see this church having to get building after building after building because revival starts to break out. I see a church that is on fire for God to the point where Wednesday, Sunday, Saturdays, whenever, get me to the house of God and I'm bringing as many people with me just like I carpooled with five dudes to a Cavs game in a car that shouldn't have had five dudes in it. What if we were filling our cars up because, man, I've got to get people. I've got to get people to the presence of God. I've got to get them there. Why? Because I believe, I believe, I believe that God wants to move so mightily in this hour in the lives of people. I believe that he wants to demonstrate his power to people like he never has before. Hey, what's up, guys? Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And if you're out there and you say, hey, I don't know this Jesus you talked about. I don't know this God that you said loves me, has a plan for my life. Or maybe you did it one time and you walked away. I want you to know God is so in love with you that he's still pursuing you. He hasn't given up on you. People might give up on you, but God never gives up on you. And coming back to him can be so, so easy. In fact, the book of Romans says it like this. It says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead and you confess him as Lord, basically that just means, God, I give you my life. Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my boss, I give you everything. You say that, and you pray that, man, the Bible says you can know, you can know you have eternal life. You know that you have heaven when you die, and you can have heaven on earth while you live. Isn't that incredible? So if that's you tonight, I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to mean it in your heart, say it out of your mouth, but say this. Say, Father God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth, you went to the cross, and then you rose from the dead. And I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And from this day forward, help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we wanna hear from you. We don't wanna leave you where you're at, but we wanna encourage you on your journey of faith. So text the word, the you, to the number 94,000, and one of our team would love to connect with you and help you on this journey of faith. And also, if you tune in tonight for the first time, thank you so much. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, giving up part of your evening. So we wanna get a free gift into your hands just for hanging out with us. So text that number 94,000 again, text the word, the you, and we wanna get a free Starbucks gift card into your hands just for hanging out with us. Like what's better than that? A free latte on us. And also one more thing before we let you guys go, we have our connect groups that just launched a couple weeks ago. And guys, if you're not a part of our groups, uh, first of all, what are you doing? Second of all, you need to get there. They're so much fun. So they're gonna be running every single Monday night, 7 p.m. here at the church. And you can sign up by uh, scanning that QR code on your screen right now. You see that right below me? Yeah, scan that bad boy and uh, get signed up tonight. And I want you guys to know this. You don't have to sign up. You can just show up, but we want to encourage you to be a part of a group. Again, that's every Monday night here at the U at 7 p.m. So we love you guys. You guys have been incredible tonight and we'll see you next week.